With the release of version 1.3, Inkscape has received some big additions and improvements, and we'll cover them all in this video. If we turn on the rulers at the top and left of the canvas, which we can do by going to View, Show Hide, and checking rulers here, the rulers now use a different color to indicate the location of the page in the canvas. Also, if we create an object and have it selected, we now get blue lines on the rulers that indicate the selected object's location. If we don't like this new feature, we can turn it off by opening the Preferences dialog, choosing Interface, and unchecking the Show Location and Ruler option here. In the color palette, we now have little circles that indicate both the fill color and the stroke color of the selected object. We can also now pin color options to the start of the palette for faster access. By default, we have unset, black, 50% gray, and white. To pin a different color, we can right click it and choose pin color. This moves the color away from its original position and adds it to the pin colors. To unpin a color, we can right click it and choose unpin color, which moves it back to its original location. By default, the pin color fields are larger than the other fields in the palette. To make the pin color fields the same size as the others, we can click the hamburger icon here on the right, go to configure, and uncheck enlarge pin colors. If the change from a snap controls toolbar to a snap controls popover in Inkscape 1.2 made you angry, we now have the option of switching back to using a toolbar. To do this, we can open up the preferences dialog, click the arrow next to interface, choose toolbars, and change the snap controls bar setting to permanent. If we show the scroll bars by going to view, show hide, and checking scroll bars, we now have a display options button at the top right which lets us change the display mode. These options are also still available in the view menu. In the path menu, we now have two new path operations, fracture and flatten. With fracture, if we have two or more overlapping objects selected, it will split the objects into all possible separate segments. It also cuts out any parts of an object that were being overlapped by another object. Next, the flatten operation removes all parts of selected paths that are hidden behind other paths. To do this previously, we had to create a duplicate of the top path and perform the difference path operation between it and the bottom path. And we had to do this for each pair of paths. So the flatten operation is definitely a big time saver. If we use the fill and stroke dialog to apply a pattern to an object, instead of getting a drop down with a long list of pattern names, we now get a preview of all of the patterns, including a lot of new ones that weren't previously available. By default, it shows us a preview of all available patterns, but we can change it to only show a particular category of patterns. We can also scroll through the categories. And up here, we can choose to show the names of the patterns along with the previews, change the size of the preview tiles, and do a search for a particular pattern. We also now have a pattern editor right here in the fill and stroke dialog, where we can change the pattern scale, orientation, offsets, and the gaps between the repetitions of the pattern. We can also change the pattern's color. If we click the Edit on Canvas button here, it switches us to the Node tool, which we can use to edit the pattern on the canvas like we could in previous versions. Also, clicking anywhere inside the pattern will now move the pattern editing controls to that position. 
A new feature of the node tool is a lasso selection mode for selecting nodes. To use it, we hold down the Alt key and click and drag, which creates this red path that follows the cursor. When we release the mouse, any nodes of the selected object that are within the area of the red path get selected. If we give an object a blur, with the node tool active, we now get these circular handles for adjusting the blur on both the vertical axis and the horizontal axis. If we hold down Ctrl as we do this, it will adjust both axes together. Previously, if we wanted to round the corners of a path, we had to first open up the Path Effects dialog and apply the corner's path effect to the path. But now, with the Node tool active, we have a new option in the Controls bar for easily applying the corner's path effect to the selected path. We now have these handles at the corners of the path that we can use to adjust the rounding. We can select and round multiple corners at once. And if we hold Ctrl and click a handle, we can cycle between the different corner types. If we click the corners button up here again, it will remove the corners path effect from the path. You might already know from previous versions that when we drag an object around with the select tool, we can press the space bar to place a duplicate of the object at the current location. Well, we can now also press the C key, which will create a clone of the object in the current location. If we modify the original object, it will modify its clones as well. After transforming an object with the Select tool, we can now press Ctrl Alt T to reapply the transformation. And if we press Ctrl Alt D, it will apply the previous transformation to a duplicate of the object. We can also select a different object and apply the previous transformation to it. If we go to the Page tool, we now have the option of adding margins to a page, either by clicking the arrows in the new Page Margins box up here and setting them this way, or by dragging these circular handles that now appear on the page. And if we turn on snapping and take a look at all of the options, we now also have a page margins option that gets enabled by default, so we can snap objects to the page's margins. This one is for those of you who love designing with type. If we go to the text tool, we now have the option up here in the controls bar for organizing fonts into collections. If we click the select font collections button, we get a list of all available font collections. By default, Inkscape provides us with two font collections, document fonts and previously used fonts. If we check the box next to one or more of the collections, then close this back up and show the font families, we now only see the ones that are included in the selected collection or collections. If we want to create our own font collections, we can click the button again, uncheck the font collections, and click the Open Collections Editor button. This brings up the Font Collections dialog, where we can see all available font families on the left side and all available font collections on the right side. To create a new font collection, we click this plus button at the bottom, type a name for the collection, and press enter. And now our new font collection is included in the list here, as well as in the drop down list up here. To add a font family to our new collection, we simply drag and drop the font family item from the list onto the font collection. We can add as many fonts to the collection as we want. We can also search for a particular font using the search box here. And to go back to showing all of the fonts, we can click this reset button. If you want to remove a font from a collection, we can click the trash icon next to the font in the font collections list. And if we check the box next to our new font collection here, we will only be able to select from the fonts in that collection. To show all fonts again, we can click this reset button. If we want to rename a font collection, we can choose it in the font collections list, then we can either click the pencil button down here, or we can double click its name. And if we want to delete a selected font collection, we can click this X button at the bottom, then click yes. And by the way, we can also create and manage font collections through the text and font dialog, using this new collections button. The Path Effects dialog has been simplified quite a bit from previous versions. 
we now just start with a search box and a label telling us what object we have selected. To add a path effect to the selected object, we can either search for the path effect using the search box, or we can click the arrow next to the box to show all of the available path effects, which have been organized into different categories. If we add a path effect to the object, the path effect display has also been changed, with all of the path effects options being shown directly underneath the path effects name. If we add another path effect to the object, we can reorder the effects by dragging and dropping them in the list. And we can also collapse the options of each effect for better visibility. As you probably already know, in order to use path effects on a text object, we have to change the text object into a path first. However, we now get the option of doing this directly inside the path effects dialog, which is pretty convenient. We also have this clone option, which will create a clone of the text object. We can add path effects to the clone without affecting the original text object. And because it's a clone, if we change the color of the original, it will also change the color of the clone. And if we change the text of the original, it will change the text of the clone. Perhaps the biggest change in Inkscape 1.3 is the addition of the Shape Builder tool. The Shape Builder tool is located here in the toolbox, and it allows us to easily combine shapes together and cut shapes out of other shapes. To use it, we first need to select some shapes, then activate the tool either by clicking this icon in the toolbox or by using the shortcut X. This turns all of the selected shapes gray with strokes separating the segments, and it hides everything else on the canvas. If we look up here in the controls bar, we have two modes, Add and Delete. Add is the default mode, and when it's active, hovering over a segment of the selected shapes highlights the segment in light blue. We have two options for using the Add mode. First, if we click and drag over some segments, it will combine them into a single path, with the strokes between them disappearing and the combined segment becoming a darker shade of blue. Second, if we simply click a segment, it will also turn blue, but it will keep the segment separate from the surrounding segments. We can also add enclosed empty areas between the shapes. If we now apply this, which we can do either by clicking the check mark button up here or by pressing the enter key, we can see that it combined the segments that we clicked and dragged over and the segments that we clicked without dragging have been separated. It also removed all of the segments that we didn't click. If we undo all of that, select the objects again and go back to the shape builder tool, the other mode we have is the delete mode. We can either choose it here, or with the Add mode still selected, we can hold down the Shift key to temporarily switch to Delete mode. Now as we hover over the shapes, the segment under the cursor will turn pink, and if we click a segment, it gets removed. We can also click and drag over segments to remove them all at once. This is good for times when we accidentally add a segment. To remove it, we can hold Shift to enter into Delete mode and click the segment. And if we apply it, here's the result. We can also undo previous actions by pressing Ctrl Z. And if we want to cancel it all together, we can either click the X button in the controls bar, or press the escape key, or choose a different tool. This is a very powerful tool, and I recommend trying it out on a lot of different combinations of shapes until you get the hang of it. Okay, so those were the biggest changes and additions in Inkscape 1.3. If you haven't already, be sure to head over to inkscape.org and grab a copy of it so you can test all of the new features out yourself. Thanks for watching.